23, Sanctification and Consecration. There need be no difficulty with the subject of sanctification once the meaning of the term is understood. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, sanctification is synonymous with separation. To be sanctified means to be set apart for God's possession and use. It's important to realise that the term has nothing whatsoever to do with the thought of cleansing or, or purification, as so many think. For example, it's recorded that prior to the advent of sin in the world, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Genesis 2 verse 3. He set aside the Sabbath as a special day. Further, the sinless Lord Jesus said, I sanctify myself in John 17 verse 19. He willingly set himself apart. He separated himself. He completely devoted himself to the work that the Father gave him to do. In this chapter we're going to look at position, condition, consecration, pseudo-consecration and spiritual consecration. First, position. It's all important to keep in mind the clear scriptural distinction between our fully sanctified position and our being sanctified position. Positionally, our Father has already done the work on our behalf, just as he has already justified, reconciled, accepted and secured us in the Lord Jesus. Now note the difference between the Corinthian position and their condition. First we read, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. And secondly, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, that there are contentions among you. 1 Corinthians 1 11. In the first place, it's heartening to realise that our sanctification is both the will of God and the work of God. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. But then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. He has sanctified us positionally because we looked to him for salvation. He will sanctify us experientially as we look to him for growth. Every believer, whether babe or veteran, is already separated to God in Christ Jesus. What makes the difference in the believer's condition is that he becomes clearly aware of his sanctified position in the risen Lord. Jude wrote his epistle to them that are sanctified by God our Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called in verse 1. Our Father has eternally set us apart and preserved us in his Son and called us to his service. All of the growing believer's life is considered service, whether it's formal or otherwise. Our sanctification is not only the will and the work of the Father, but it is in and through the Son. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us sanctification. Here we can see that our positional sanctification is a gift, just as is our righteousness. When through faith we were born into Jesus Christ, he became our righteousness and our sanctification, not partially, but completely. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10. It is a great relief and joy for the struggling believer to realise that 
when he received Christ as his righteousness by faith, he also received him as his sanctification. Many people struggle and work for a righteousness of their own until they finally receive his righteousness by faith. Then as believers, they set about to labour through the whole futile process again, struggling to produce a sanctification of their own instead of resting in his sanctification as a gift. The Lord Jesus sent Paul unto the Gentiles to open their eyes that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Acts 26 verse 18. As is everything else in our position in Christ, our sanctification is perfect. It's once for all, complete, eternal. It could not be otherwise since the Lord Jesus himself is our sanctification. Hebrews 10 verses 10 and 14 leaves no question about this, this wonderful fact. We read, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his life, our Father has created us anew and given us a completely separated position before himself, separated from all that would hinder that blessed relationship. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5:17. In Ecclesiastes 3.14 we read this, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be for ever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it. Next we look at condition. As we abide in our position of sanctification, there is growth in our condition of sanctification. Although the Holy Spirit participated in establishing our positional sanctification, and we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but you were washed, but you were sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God, he is mainly concerned with our condition of sanctification. He it is who brings us into experiential separation to the Father. Peter wrote in his epistle, To the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit. 1 Peter 1 2. Truth is the basis of which the Holy Spirit carries out his ministry. He is the Spirit of truth, the truth of the Scriptures. John 16, verse 30. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. The Lord Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, verse 17. It is by means of the Spirit-ministered word that we see and understand the facts concerning our position of sanctification in the Lord Jesus. Without the spiritual facts, there would be nothing on which we could base our faith. But as we see that the Holy Spirit has already sanctified us in Christ, we are able to trust him to separate us to God in our condition. The Spirit carries out his subjective work in our lives from the basis or the source, the standing, the position or the objective truth of our eternal completeness in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. In this matter of faith in the word of God, it is essential to distinguish between God's promises and his facts. 
Promises are to be anticipated. Facts are to be accepted. We wait on our Father to fulfil his promises in his own good time, according to his will and his integrity. On the other hand, facts are to be appropriated and enjoyed now. We are to accept them with thanksgiving. By faith, we know that we are justified, Romans 5.1. That we are reconciled, Colossians 1.20-22. That we are accepted, Ephesians 1.5-7. And that we are sanctified, Acts 26 verse 18. Since the Holy Spirit ministers to us through the channel of faith, he gives in our condition what we appropriate from our positional standing. For instance, in the matter of peace, from our position of justification, we receive peace concerning the penalty of our sins. For our reconciliation, we receive peace with God. From our acceptance, we receive the peace of God. And from our sanctification, peace and assurance that he will conform us to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next, we look at consecration. Without a clear understanding of our position of sanctification, there can be no valid consecration to dedicate, to separate, to consecrate ourselves to God is simply our response of faith to the separation, to the sanctification in which God has already placed us. It is acknowledging our position of sanctification. Consecration does not call upon us to do anything, but to rest in what God has already done. Unless we know that we have been sanctified in the Lord Jesus, we cannot respond in consecration to him. We now look at a pseudo-consecration. Why does so much sincere consecration amount to nothing? The main reason is that the most well-meaning Christians seek to consecrate to God that which he's totally and forever rejected. Not yet understanding their position of sanctification as new creations in Christ, they consecrate self to God in the hope that the old man will become spiritual and thus usable in his service. The believer must learn by two means the fact that the self-life is unimprovable. First, through specific scriptures. God never intends to improve the old man, because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Further, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Galatians 5.17 Anything of the first Adam is unalterably opposed to everything of the last Adam. Self is implacable in its attitude towards God, having the very essence of the enemy. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8.7 so first, through specific scriptures, but secondly, the believer must learn that the self-life is unimprovable through personal experience. One's daily life proves beyond a doubt that the sinful Adamic source within never changes. The awakened and honest believer must admit that self is as capable of sin after 50 years of Christian life as it was before he was saved. Sometimes it seems even more so. No, our Father can accept nothing, nothing of the Adamic life 
no matter how good or, or how religious it may seem in the natural realm. And when the believer sees that God has taken all the old life to the cross and crucified it with Christ, he will likewise count it crucified or reckon it crucified and take his place of consecration as alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so finally, we look at scriptural consecration. True, acceptable, abiding consecration is expressed most clearly in Romans 6, verse 13, where we read, Neither yield to your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Here we have the key statement in scripture concerning consecration. As those that are alive from the dead. We know that the old man didn't rise from the dead. The wages of sin is death. And the sinful Adamic life was condemned and crucified in Christ on the cross. Romans 6 verse 6. But the recreated life, the new man in Christ, arose from the dead in his resurrection, in Christ's resurrection. We read, you were raised up with him, with Christ, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. Colossians 2 Verses 12 and 13. It is this new life, our Christian life, the life that is already hid with Christ in God that we are to yield and to consecrate and to set apart unto the Father. It is the only acceptable life, the life that he has already accepted in his beloved Son. In consecration, we are carrying out our responsibility of responding to that which he's already done, of willing according to his will, of gladly yielding to him that which already belongs to him. In the matter of life, it is yield yourselves unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness. Romans 6 verse 13. In the matter of service, it is present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Romans 12 verse 1. Consecration is based upon reckoning. Romans 6 verse 11. We turn from the old man by counting ourselves to have died unto sin and to self. We turn to our position in the risen Lord Jesus by counting ourselves as new creations alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Abide above. 24. Identification and growth. Positional truth is the basis of every sphere of our Christian life. But nowhere are we more dependent on the principle of position than in the understanding of our identification with the Lord Jesus in his death to sin and resurrection to God. As in all positional steps, identification is not experiential, but is a matter of placing our faith in the facts of the Word of God. Whereas justification has to do with birth, being born again, identification has to do with growth. And growth is to continue until we see him face to face. First we look at position. When we received the Lord Jesus as our Saviour and thus were born into him as our life, all that he is and all that he has became ours. Justification, that is his righteousness, was perhaps all that we could apprehend at the time. But that was only the beginning of an infinity of wonders into which we are to enter now and throughout eternity. Because of our grace-given position in the air, in Jesus, 
We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17. All is held in trust for us in Christ, our new position, and becomes our condition as we are taken forward step by step in faith. When we are able to receive and appreciate the benefits of the riches of Romans chapters 1 to 5, then he is free to take us into the reality of the wealth of Romans chapters 6 to 8. When we are firmly established in the positional truth of Christ dying for our sins and rising again for our justification, as seen in Romans 4 verse 25, then we are prepared to see our position and enter into the benefits of our having died and risen with him in Romans 6 verse 5. Now, let us look at some of the positional truths concerning our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Romans 6 verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For us to be reborn, newly created in the risen life of the Saviour, God had to free us from the penalty of sin and the nature of the fallen Adam. He accomplished this by placing us in Christ on the cross, by identifying each of us as future believers with him. Thus, when Christ died to sin, out of the realm and the reign of the principle of sin, when he died to sin, we as sinners died to sin in him. Why should this be so difficult to comprehend when we understand clearly that the Lord Jesus died for everyone's sin, all future at the time, that he died for every one of our sins on the same cross? He was identified with our sin in order that we might become identified with his righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 we read this, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We know that the Lord Jesus rose again, once he paid in full the wages of sin. Since we were identified with him in his death, and thereby were freed from both the penalty and the power of sin, we know that he arose with us in his resurrection. It could not be otherwise. In Romans 6, verse 8, we read this. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And in Romans 6, verse 10, we read, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. The Lord Jesus died to the power and reign of sin. And he rose again in the power of an everlasting life. Hebrews 7 verse 16. Identified with him on the cross, we too died to sin's tyrannical dominion. And we have been buried with him through spiritual baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4. God provides the fact before he calls for faith. Early in Romans 6, we're asked this. Know you not that all who were identified with the Lord Jesus were identified in his death? Romans 6 verse 3. And then in verse 6, Paul says this. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. It is not until the facts of our identification with Christ are understood that we are admonished to exercise faith. In this way, there is no effort or struggle to consider because we know. Yes, it is in the clear light of identification with Christ in his death and resurrection that direction is given to consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 11. 
It would be utterly impossible for the Father even to suggest that we count ourselves as having died to sin and become alive to him in Jesus if it were not already true of us. Nor could he ever call on us to consecrate ourselves to him as from the dead, Romans 6.13, if he hadn't already made us new creations in the risen Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. However, true as our identification with the Lord Jesus is, if we are not fully aware of the facts, we will derive little benefit from them in our daily life. And that is where we need them. Moreover, unless we realise our need of the separating or sanctifying power of our death and life in him, there will be no motivation for our faith to reach out and receive. To dwell on a positional fact is to see it clearly, to believe it, to count on it, to receive and appropriate the practical reality of it with thanksgiving. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Colossians 2 verse 7 Death and judgment are behind us, grace and glory are before. All the billows rolled o'er Jesus, there they spent their utmost power. Jesus died and we died with him, buried in his grave we lay, one with him in resurrection, now in him, in heaven's bright day. The gracious spirit of truth revealed to us that the Lord Jesus died for our sins and by faith in the fact we entered into the position of justification which is included in our complete and eternal salvation. But when the Holy Spirit reveals to us the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ having died to sin, and our identification with him in the death and resurrection, by faith in the facts we acknowledge our position, and we reckon ourselves to have died to sin and to be forever alive to God, in Christ. That which we reckon in our position becomes experiential in our condition. As we count ourselves to have died to sin on the cross, the effect of that cross is applied by the Holy Spirit to the sinful self-life. 2 Corinthians 4.11 says this, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Self is crucified, held in the place of death, as we are led into sacrificial paths for his glory. As self is thus dealt with by the cross, our condition reflects progressively the facts of our position in Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11. Now we look at condition. But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from the power of sin, you became servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Our daily experience can be no more true than the doctrine that we hold and by which we are held. So the steps that we would follow are these. First, we finally see and understand our position, our identification with Christ in having died to the dominion of sin and been made alive to God in him. Second, we become aware of the need to be separated in our condition, separated from self and separated unto Christ. Third, we exercise faith in the completed work of our position by reckoning upon the facts of our death and resurrection in Christ. And fourth, on the basis of this faith, 
the Holy Spirit is free to translate the truth of our position into our daily condition. The Spirit of Christ is extremely practical in his operations. He uses everyday means in bringing our positional sanctification into our experience. As we reckon upon the fact of self's crucifixion, he conveys the effect of that unfinished work into our lives through daily circumstances. Due to our weakness and sinfulness, he's able to utilise situations and human relationships to show us what we are in ourselves. We are thereby faced with the choice, self or Christ. If we count ourselves to have died to sin and self, the emancipation of the cross is experienced within. And as we abide in the Lord Jesus, knowing ourselves to be alive to God in him, he is free to manifest himself more fully in our condition. This is spiritual growth. The works of the flesh are curtailed. The fruit of the spirits revealed. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 Unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12.24 this statement of the principle of life out of death applies primarily to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the grain of wheat. The grain of wheat who refused to abide alone as God's only begotten son, but gave himself at Calvary to become the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29. Since he died and rose again, thereby bringing forth much fruit, and that harvest being after his kind, our lives, as similar grains of wheat, are based on the same principle of life out of death. No matter how self-contained and comfortable our Christian life may be, there's bound to develop a deep heart hunger to see others become grains of wheat. The Lord Jesus shall see his seed. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isaiah 53 verses 10 and 11. His heart hunger is expressed through Paul, who says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Galatians 4:19. And the Spirit of Christ yearns in our hearts that the Lord Jesus may gain a rich and a lasting harvest of golden grain through us. This entire life out of death process is directly related to our reckoning upon our position of life out of death. As we yearn to be used, to multiply, to be brought to harvest, the Holy Spirit takes us down into death in our experience. He plants or buries us in these difficult situations or that dark area. And as the old life is thus held in the place of death, inoperative, the new life grows up and is manifested not only in us, but in others through us. So then death worketh in us, but life in you, life in others. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 12. Conversely, when we are self-centred and refuse the path of the cross, we think little of others and everything of ourselves. We scheme, fight, manoeuvre and even pray to abide alone. But the Lord Jesus has established the principle that Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. In other words, no fruit, no harvest. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. The same shall see it multiplied and harvested in others. 
Luke 9, 24. Actually, the Holy Spirit patiently uses everything and everyone in the process of bringing us to the grain of wheat stage. When we are self-centred and carnal, he applies the appropriate pressures, perhaps in the physical body or the home or the place of work, and thereby in time causes us to hunger to be Christ-centred. When we begin to see and hate the self-life for what it is, when we begin to see and love the Lord Jesus for who he is, then we become willing for the Holy Spirit to take self into death in order that Christ may be formed in us. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labour, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for the good of those who love God and are called according to his design and his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, those he was aware of and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning, or foreordained them, he destined them from the beginning to be moulded into the image of his Son and to share inwardly his likeness, so that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Part 25. Sin and Purged Conscience. Briefly, it can be said that due to the fall, man came into possession of a moral sense to distinguish right and wrong, known as conscience. Man's sinful condition, however, renders conscience an unreliable guide. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit works on the conscience in bringing conviction of sin. So we're going to look at the natural man, the carnal man, the spiritual man. First, the natural man. Due to such factors as heredity, social and religious training and environment, the conscience of the unbeliever has an erratic range all the way from good to very bad. But either way, its ground of reference is wrong since it's centred in the self-life. When they measure themselves with themselves and compare themselves with one another, they're without understanding and behave unwisely. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2. At best, the unsaved are under legal bondage. They are a law to themselves. They show that the essential requirements of the law are written in their hearts and are operating there, with which their conscience, or their sense of right and wrong, also bears witness. Romans 2 verses 14 and 15. Even when the unbeliever's conscience is clear, this state is often attained by a combination of rationalisation and good works, resulting in self-righteousness. Hence, his so-called good conscience is the very element that tends to keep him from seeing his need for God's righteousness and life. On the other hand, when his conscience is bad, he flees from God with a sense of despair because of personal unworthiness. It is only when the Holy Spirit convicts the mind, heart and conscience concerning sin, whether of self-righteousness or of unworthiness, that the sinner can see his need of turning to Christ. Next, the carnal man. As far as his conscience is concerned, the carnal Christian is much the same as the unbeliever, the natural man. By dint of self-effort to produce some good works for God, and the blind rationalisation of comparing himself with supposedly weaker Christians, he's able sporadically to maintain some semblance of a good conscience. This very feeling, false as it is, tends to exaggerate his dependence upon himself. We read in 2 Corinthians 10, 17 and 18, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, 
but whom the Lord commendeth. When the carnal believer's conscience is bad, he seeks to hide from God and even attempts to place the blame for his sinfulness on others. Yet the Holy Spirit often works through the conscience to turn such a person to the Lord Jesus for cleansing from unrighteousness and for spiritual growth. Let us all come forward and draw near with true, that is, honest and sincere hearts, in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, that is, by the learning of the entire human personality on God and in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty or evil conscience. Hebrews 10 verse 22. And then we come to the spiritual man. The believer who rests in his position rather than his condition and who abides in his risen Lord in the presence of the Father is growing spiritually. He is fully assured that Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18. By simple faith in the facts, he acknowledges his place in Christ, who is his life, the one who, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Knowing his sins to be purged once for all, his conscience is thereby clear, since the worshippers once purged have no more conscience of sin, Hebrews 10 verse 2. The spiritually minded believer is conscious of sin in himself, but he is fully assured that there is no sin on him. All of his sin has been laid on the Lord Jesus. Although his condition is needy, for he is indwelt by the principle of sin, he lives in his position in Christ. His constant resources for spiritual growth are received from on high. He knows his freedom to come boldly unto the throne of grace in order that he may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4 verse 16. When the growing believer sins, his conscience and his communion with the Father being thereby disturbed, he freely confesses his sin. He knows that the Lord Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. And he also has recourse to the truth that when he does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John 2 verse 1. Hence a pure conscience and communion are restored and maintained and he is free to continue his fellowship with the Father and the Son. He has learned that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1 7 So now we look at the difference between the condition and the position. But first, condition. The condition-centred Christian has no other recourse but to fight against indwelling sin and thus seek to control self as best as he can. Added to this intolerable burden is the frustrating fact that God doesn't seem to help him in his endeavour. He's immersed in the defeat of Romans 7. He battles here below only to lose. He should rest above where he is sure to win. One of the chief reasons so many believers are spiritually ill, as well as mentally and physically, is a guilty, oppressed conscience. They are labouring under the burden of their unrighteous condition, rather than resting in the liberty of their righteous position. And sad to say, there aren't many of God's people today who know anything about a pure and perfect conscience. Countless Christians, including those who are awakened and hungry to grow, are bound by a bad conscience. They are honestly aware of their sinful condition, but they're only vaguely aware of their perfect position. This chapter has to do with the basic reason for the guilty conscience, which is the indwelling principle of sin. The next chapter will deal with the product of that principle, 
sins committed. First the cause, then the effect. There's a tremendous paradox in the Christian who, although redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ from the penalty and tyranny of sin, nevertheless is rendered spiritually helpless and useless by an overwhelming burden of guilt. We are thinking of the hungry-hearted Christian who is awakened to the sin of self, since he is the only one who is ready, that is, prepared by the Holy Spirit, ready to be freed from the guilty condition. Awareness of need is the primary motivation for intelligent faith. Is this not the cry of the honest, struggling, guilt-ridden believer? I do not understand my own actions. I'm baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very things I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. However, it is no longer I who do the deed, but the sin, the sin principle, which is at home in me and has possession of me. Romans 7, verse 15 and 17. Here is the progressing believer who sees his condition, but not as yet his position. And so we look at position next. There is but one place in which faith can rest, and that is on the Lord Jesus where the Father has positioned us, and it is only in that abiding place that our conscience can be clear with regard to the indwelling sin. Our guilt cannot be relieved through removal of the sin within, because that principle will be present as long as we reside in our unredeemed bodies. Nor is there hope of relief through improvement of self, since in the flesh there dwells no good thing to improve. There was also the problem of a guilty conscience prior to Calvary. Then, into the holy place made with hands, went the high priest alone once a year, not with blood, which he'd offered for himself and for the errors of the people, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, but Christ, being come and high priest, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 7, 9, 11 and 12. Yes, our Lord Jesus appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9, 26. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, verses 10, 12 and 14. As new creations in Christ Jesus, we have been redeemed from the penalty of indwelling sin, and further we have been sanctified, that is, separated, from the domination of that same principle of sin. We have sin in us, but not on us. Always indwelling, but never imputed. And it's essential to know how definitely and thoroughly God dealt with this sin principle, especially since its presence within us is so burdensome. God sent his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, Romans 8, 3. The principle of sin has not been forgiven. It has not been cleansed. Neither has it been improved or removed. But thanks be to God, it has been condemned by the crucifixion of the cross. In his flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ condemned the sin of our flesh. And thus condemned, there can now be no condemnation for us. We read in Romans 8 verses 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
It is due to this blessed fact that our conscience finds peace and is purged from the guilt of indwelling sin. It should not be difficult for us to make the correct choice between the consciousness of our condition and the revelation of our position. If, because of feeling and lack of scriptural knowledge, we put more stock on our condition than our position, we will continue to labour under the intolerable burden of a defiled conscience. But if we agree with God concerning his condemnation of the old man, there is a perfectly peaceful conscience for us in the matter of indwelling sin. It is the infinite difference between our telling him what we are in ourselves, condition, or heeding his testimony as to what we are in his son, which is position. The former means guilt and enslavement, the latter freedom and growth. At Calvary, when our Lord Jesus was made to be sin for us, he was crucified and thereby sin was condemned. At the same time, he took each potential believer as a sinner down into that death. Then he brought us up out of death as new creations in his resurrection life. Now and forever, the only position we have as believers is before our Father in his risen Son, cut off or sanctified from our old relationship to indwelling sin by our death and resurrection in him. Once for all, the Lord Jesus has separated us in death and resurrection from both the guilt and the power of indwelling sin. Hebrews 9.26 says, But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And in Hebrews 2.11 we read, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Resting in this position not only purges our conscience from all guilt concerning the self-life, but also gives us increasing freedom from its domination. Why not acknowledge and thank him for this wonderful position, purchased at infinite price and so freely given? Anything we do short of resting in him as our position, anything we attempt to do beyond that rest, is to slight the perfection of his life and his work. Colossians 3 verse 3 says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9 verse 14.